welcome 930. Uh, thanks again for showing up to church today. Really means a lot. Um, I know pastors all over the valley had to make a difficult decision this week, and many of my friends in different states were forced to uh, not assemble today. And, um, and so I understand how difficult that decision was. And so um, we went into it saying there may be three people at church today, but praise God for it. And so I'm thankful that so many of you showed up to church today. A little bit, that's awesome. Um, but we're in a fitting, we're in a fitting series called Peaks and Valleys, and we've been talking about faith. We've been talking about how to have faith in God when it makes sense and when it doesn't. When you see it and when you feel it and when you don't. How to have faith in the midst of a mountainous peak and in the lowest valley you've ever experienced. So I think today will be a timely word um, in your life. And so um, even this week, you know, this will be a week you will remember for the rest of your life. And um, I can imagine telling my grandkids about this week and the weeks to come. And, uh, and we'll do it with a place of, you should have seen the world go nuts, but you should have seen our hope in Christ. You should have seen it. That's what I'm excited to tell and show the news clips of, of just crazy chaos everywhere. But in the midst of our home, we celebrated the fact that we had Christ living in us. And so um, even yesterday, um, I, you know, it's, it's hard to escape. You turn on the TV and everyone's talking about it. You go on social media, everyone's talking about it. You call your mom and you just want to say happy birthday. And it's all you talk about. And so yesterday I found myself kind of in this thing, and I'm not worried about it, but I'm kind of like, you know, it's just everywhere. And here's what I found yesterday, my little three-year-old son. Um, you know, we're potty training, which is a really bad week to start that. We didn't know when we started a week ago. Um, <laughs> So, but in one side, it's really good because we're stuck inside all week. But, like, I was losing my mind. And I'm begging him, like, can we just go somewhere? But then I'm like, well, we're not supposed to go anywhere. You know, whatever. <laughs> and so I'm trying to be responsible and prudent. But also, like, I'm going to lose myself in this house. And so uh, we went out and we played soccer in our street with this little soccer ball for about an hour. And he was so full of joy. He was so excited. He was so happy. And then we got in the car and I was like, well, let's just go for a drive. And when I was driving, my son, he was like, Turn the, uh, put the windows down. And so it was a perfect night last night. And the windows were down. And I looked and I, we were driving north. And there were, I, I almost think, hundreds of hot air balloons in the air at one time. And so the sunset was beautiful. The wind, a good song on. And I'm sitting there to myself and I'm like, God, you are so good. Even in the midst of all this, I'm driving by the grocery store and people are knocking each other. No, I'm just kidding. They were. Because I live by Sun City. <laughs> but... But verbally, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but in the midst of all that, I just had this overwhelming peace. And I want you to know something about your God. He is the God of peace. He is the God of comfort. He draws close to us when we need him the most. So I believe, church, this is our shining moment where we can exude and live out what we say we believe. We say we live in peace. Well, let's live that publicly. Let's live that out loud in front of people. And I believe the world is looking for Jesus in the midst of all this. And, and saints, I believe you're going to scream the gospel when you live in peace and when you live in the truth of who God is. So we are in a series called Peaks and Valleys. We've been talking about faith. And today the message title is Double Fisted Faith. Double fisted faith, and maybe you've heard this term before, maybe you've heard it used, we've been going through this thing called Rooted, and there's a title of one of the days called Double Fisted Faith, and this day really captured my heart because it's the essence of faith at its fullest, and I'm going to talk about that, you will fully understand what it means to have double fisted faith by the time you leave here today, but I'm going to start by posing some questions, because I want to get you thinking about the God we serve, and sometimes we make bold requests, and God answers. Sometimes we make bold requests, and it seems like God didn't hear us, God doesn't answer us. And there's this, this challenge we have in ourselves of, well, what do I do when God answers, but what do I do when he doesn't? Where is my faith then? And so my question for you is, have you ever prayed for something before and God answered it? No doubting in the whole world that it was God himself who answered your prayer. Anyone in the room, you testify, God absolutely has shown up and answered my prayer. I believe that. I know that. 
We're actually in this building, I believe, because of bold, audacious, ridiculous prayers colliding with a God that had planned and purposed our church to exist. And, and I saw God answer a Hail Mary prayer. There's no way this could ever happen, and then it happens. And God did it. But on the other side of that question, have you ever prayed a, bro a bold prayer? Have you ever asked God for something and it didn't happen or you haven't seen it yet? Now, now this, is, this is a crux of our faith because it's so easy to believe when God answers it just how we prayed it. But what do we do? What are we left with when what we've prayed for doesn't happen when we've been praying for a healing in our body and our body is still failing us where is our faith when we've prayed for that job and we've just lost it where is God in the midst of all that what about during a relationship we've been praying for reconciliation but we haven't seen it maybe it's a house we've been praying for this house in this neighborhood and it hasn't happened maybe it's uh you've been praying for a child and you've tried everything you can do, and it hasn't happened. Where is our faith in the midst of when God doesn't seem to answer? I believe this is a question at the core of every single one of us. Whether you're coming out of your miracle and you've just seen God do something and so you're on that high. Or maybe you feel like I'm on the other side of that. I've been asking. I've been pleading. I've been praying. I've offered it to godly people. God, when are you going to do it? Are you ever going to do it? See, as we read our Bible, we are filled with stories of times when God showed up in the impossible situation. When I see Elijah cry out to God and say, God, would you bring fire from heaven to show that you are God? And then I read about him doing it. That's when God heard and answered in an unbelievable, miraculous way when people came up to Jesus over and over and over in the Gospels and said, would you heal my son? Would you heal my body? Would you heal and deliver me from this? And over and over and over we see Jesus do it and do it and do it. So, so we know these examples of when God shows up, and many of us, we've experienced that you raised your hand just a moment ago. I've experienced God do this before. I've seen cancer eradicated. I've seen miracle pregnancies. I've seen lost people come to know Jesus as their Savior. I've seen relationships restored. I've seen marriages put back together. I've seen wayward children come home. I've seen it. So our faith is strong and unwavering in the shadow of a great miracle. But what about when it doesn't happen? What do we do? You see, I could get up here all day and I could quote you God's promises. And they are true and they are for you and they are eternal promises. But some of the things that we pray for, we just don't seem to happen. So I could lob a verse at you. And tell you just to recite that and pray that. Or we could talk about the why. Why is it that God seemingly sometimes does not answer our prayer the way we asked? What happens when the faithful saint prays for years for cancer to leave and they die of cancer? Where are we left in our heart? What happens when you pray for that job and you still lose it? What happens when you still have to move? What happens when people still mistreat you and try to harm you? What happens when your spouse doesn't want to reconcile? Where is our faith? What do we do when what we've prayed for doesn't happen? So that's the central question. And I hope there's some tension in you right now because some of y'all are a little maybe uncomfortable. Are you questioning God's power? The other side of this is, is I I've asked this my whole life. I've always wondered, so I believe that there should be a tension inside of you right now about what, what do I do in the midst of this question. And then you start asking some questions. Is there a problem with me or is there a problem with God? When God doesn't answer, am I doing something wrong? 
Do I not have enough faith? Am I not saying the right words? Am I not spending long enough asking, God, are you too busy? God, has my sin turned you away from me? These are questions when we're praying and God doesn't seem to answer. What's wrong with me or what's wrong with God? So we're going to read three different, a little bit lengthy texts today. We're going to be in Hebrews 11 to start. And I want you to know the context of what we're about to read. The author of Hebrews, before, right where we're about to read, starting in verse 32, he lists what's called the hall of faith. And he lists all these incredible men and women of God, Abraham, Noah, Moses, Joseph, Rahab, listing these incredible people of God that had extraordinary faith. But then we collide with verse 32. And, and we're going to see what seems to look like God hears the prayers and acts for some of them, but not for all of them. Okay? So we're going to read together, starting in verse 32. Hebrews says, and what more shall I say? He had just talked about how incredible these people of faith were. What more should I say? I just told you about these heroes and giants of the Bible. I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and David, and Samuel, and the prophets, and all of them, I wanted to go down these rabbit trails of telling you the extraordinary things that God did in their lives. But for time's sake, um, you can go read some of those. But he just says, I don't have time to talk about what God's done with these guys. And through faith, faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. He's talking about, man, God has done incredible things. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. And if you stop at verse 35... You'll say every one of these people saw the full deliverance of God just like they asked. And then you get to verse 36, or the back end of verse 35, I'm sorry. It says, there were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging. This was intense beating. And even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. I know that's graphic. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith. These are still the giants of the faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. So you see two completely different groups of people lumped together as people of extraordinary faith. You have people that prayed a bold, crazy, audacious prayer, and God seemed to answer it just like they prayed. And then you see another group, a group that's praying the same prayers. God, would you deliver me right now in this hour? And it seems as if God heard one group and didn't hear the other. If you don't read any more, if you don't investigate any further, it seems as if God heard one group and did what they asked and heard another group and didn't do anything at all. You see, the people that God answered, I need you to know something about them. Because they're all grouped together, incredible people of faith. They didn't have more supernatural faith than the other group. They didn't have the right words that the other group didn't have. They weren't looked upon more favorably by God than the other group. Th that's a truth. It wasn't about what one group was doing and the other group wasn't. God loved them and heard them the exact same. God was burdened in his heart for their trouble, the exact same. So why did God seem to rescue some and not others? 
I'm going to give you one of the most profound answers you'll ever hear in church. I don't know. I don't know. This gets into the mind of God. This gets into the plan, the purpose, and the sovereignty of God. There's good news coming, but I don't know. A, a sheep doesn't understand the mind of the shepherd. And it's impossible in our limited view of things to understand an eternal God who sees all things. And sees how this one situation, how this is going to impact ten situations away. So God is able to see that in his ability to see eternally. And in our limited view, we can't see that. So what it seems like God didn't hear me, God didn't answer me. In fact, God was doing something that you had no ability to actually comprehend or see in that moment. What it seems like God turned a deaf ear to, God was actually doing something in the midst of it. And so when our prayers are unanswered in the way that we ask, you need to know something about the eternal seeing God that you serve. He has seen where you're going. He's went before you. And so... so if God has not answered it exactly how you've prayed it, you need to know that God is still good. I'm praying that coronavirus would be eradicated right now, that not one other person would get sick. But even if they do, God is still good. God is still in control. God is still faithful. He's still in control. He still holds the universe in the palm of his hands. In verse 39, it says, these were all commended for their faith. Watch this. Yet none of them received what had been promised. What, Abraham, Noah, Jacob, Elijah, all these giants of the Bible. You're telling me they didn't receive what had been promised? No. Here's what. Because what God had promised was an eternal promise. That I will be with you to the end of the ages, but... You will have no more sickness, no more death, no more guilt, no more shame. And that's what heaven will be. Amen. And so the promises of God for us are eternal promises. Now, does God work on this planet? Yes, he does. Every day, all the time, God is working in our midst. But the promises that you can hold on to today is that God has made eternal promises to me that there will be no more suffering, there will be no more pain, there will be no more broken relationship, there'll be no more sin, there'll be no more judgment, it, it, it won't exist. And that's an eternal promise. So when, when the Bible says that none of them had received a promise, the promise for them was eternal life with Jesus. That was the promise. And so the fullness of God's promise is still yet to come for all of us. It's still yet to come, that eternal promise. And when Jesus returns, we will fully understand and experience the promises of God. But until then, what we're called to do is have faith in the will of God. His will, his plan, his purposes, and sometimes they just don't make sense. Sometimes they don't always add up. And you've experienced this. And that tension you're feeling is because you, you feel this in yourself. The thing that you prayed that, God, you would get the glory. You would be lifted up. God, it would be for your good. And it didn't happen. There was a greater will than yours. And that was God's. Why did it still happen? Why did I not be removed? I don't know. But I know God's will is bigger than ours. Let me use an example of this. So Paul is the majority author of the New Testament, wrote about 60% of what we read today. He's probably the greatest missionary that's ever walked planet Earth. And so we read, and we're going to read in 2 Corinthians 12. I want this to show you what this tension looks like. As Paul is going to plead God to do something, and God is not going to do it in the way that Paul asked. But God did something even better in the midst of it, okay? Paul asks for something specific. God doesn't do it the way he asked, but something better happens. Okay, 2 Corinthians 12, we're going to start in verse 1. I wanted, to, I wanted to skip past this, but I want you to just see where Paul's coming from in the beginning. He says, I must go on boasting, bragging. Although there is nothing to be gained, 
I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man. I know a guy. In Christ, who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. There's some really cool teaching points here that I can't go down. But caught up to the third heaven, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, greatest missionary that's ever walked the earth, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. It's like, I got some stuff to boast about. You raised someone from the dead, I have. I could boast. If you want me to boast, I'll boast. But I'm not going to, even though I could and should. I'd be speaking the truth. But I refrain. So no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. Or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Watch this. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. Given. A messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, I heard what you said. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness. So that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Man, someone needs to know this. God heard Paul. And God hears you. And sometimes that prayer intersects with his will. And guess what? He shows up and a miracle happens. And, and, and your health is restored. And a relationship is revived. And you're fine. Whatever it is, it happens. But sometimes we plead with God. And God hears us but does something different. Paul is crying out. And in verse 7 it says that he received a thorn in my flesh. A messenger of Satan, right? These are strong words. What does this actually mean? What is a, a thorn in Paul's flesh? This has been argued for a couple centuries, okay? No one exactly knows what Paul had. Was it a physical ailment? Was it Jewish persecution? Was it memories that haunted him from his past? Was it epilepsy? Was it malaria? Was it um, convulsive attacks? Was it temptation or depression? Scholars have given evidences to all of those things. But we know that this was a profound, what would seem like a hindrance in his life. I didn't ask for this, God. In fact, I pleaded. Not like, God, would you do it? No, I pleaded. Paul probably cried. He was anguished. God, take this from me. I don't want this. So does Paul not have enough faith? Is this an issue of faith? Paul, you're not praying right. You don't have enough belief. You just, no, we don't see that. It's not an issue of faith. Is he asking wrong? I don't think so. Pleading is just opening your heart completely. Is God too busy? <laughs> this, would, this would lead me to these kind of questions. What is Paul doing wrong? Or is it that God had a bigger purpose in not taking the thorn away? Is it that God saw something eternally that it was best for Paul to have this for the rest of his life? Well, that's another conclusion that we may come to. And what we see in the next verse is we get the reason for why God wouldn't take the, the thorn away. And it said to keep me from becoming conceited. God knew the plan that Paul had on his life. 
He was going to go to a Gentile nation, a nation that the Jews had rejected, and he's going to go share the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected, and that this was for the whole world. He knew that, but in that, you know, it would be pretty easy to get puffed up and boasted up, and man, I got the message. I got the revelation. I got the words of God. And right, to puff yourself up above the knowledge of God, which is in fact exactly what Satan did. And so God saw far past that moment of anguish and said, I got a whole lifetime plan for you but I need you to stay humble and keep me first and so in order to do that I'm not going to remove the thorn it wasn't a physical actually like a thorn it's a metaphor to an ailment something that Paul was forced to live with that he didn't want to and then God says one of the most powerful things in the entire Bible Paul is anguished Paul is searching, Paul is praying, God, take it, take it, take it. And what God's response was, was my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. God's answer was, I'm not going to remove the hindrance. My answer is, you get all of my grace and power. Doesn't make it any less uncomfortable but it means that we have full access to the power and grace of God. And there is nothing on the planet like grace living in you, living through you, and then the power that is unleashed in our weakness. And this is hard as like red-blooded, I was going to say meat-eating, but I don't want to offend anyone. Okay, <laughs> that's just an old metaphor, okay. Good-eating Americans. To think that we need to be weak to anything or anyone. No, 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 no. I don't need to be weak. I don't need counseling. I don't, I don't need anyone to see that I got a vulnerability. No. That's not our culture. That is not how we're told to operate. But then we come colliding into a truth about who God is that the only way that his power can be perfected and made whole in you is actually through your weakness. Through your lack. That's the truth about God. And so today, good news church, your weakness is actually working for you. Your weakness can actually be an incredible blessing. Because that is when God's perfect power and perfect grace covers you. So that's an example of someone praying and pleading, God would you take this, God would you remove this, God would you change this, and God didn't, but it was for a bigger and more purposeful reason. Okay, I want you to know, if God has not answered you, should you keep praying the rest of your life? Yes, never stop asking. Don't ever stop asking for your healing, don't ever stop asking for your miracle, don't ever stop asking for reconciliation, never stop. But even if God doesn't, it's not that he didn't hear you. It's not that your faith wasn't right. It's not that your words were wrong. God's will was maybe just different. I think there's confidence we can live in from that. Last thing I'll read is in Daniel chapter 3. And this is a children's, um, you maybe heard this all the way back in children's church about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego going into a fiery furnace. For many of you, this will be a familiar story, but I want you to see what double-fisted faith looks like. You see, these are men that believe in God, but now they're forced to live out what they've said they believe. Because now the king, the most powerful man in the entire world, is going to tell them something that they have to do. And it's going to come in complete collision with their faith. And so let's read Daniel chapter 3, starting in verse 12. Here's what it says. It says, but there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. This is one of the king, Nebuchadnezzar's, one of his lieutenants is telling him. There are some Jews you've set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three men, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Nebuchadnezzar had made himself God. And had, in fact, proposed an edict and forced all Jews that you can no longer serve your God, pray to your God, talk about your God. This is worship for me and me alone. Okay? This is the condition they're living in. Verse 13. Furious with rage, 
Nebuchadnezzar summoned, summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? It's a challenge. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him. This is real life. This isn't figurative. Furnace is like there. They've seen it lit up. They know what 900 degrees looks like. This is not somewhere a human wants to step into. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him. King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Watch this. This is the first fist. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace... The God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us. This is full faith. I've seen God do it before. God can surely do it again. It's faith that says he will. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. God's going to do it. God's done it before. I'm believing for it today. But watch this. Even if he doesn't, I won't ever stop worshiping God. I won't ever stop giving him my praise. I won't stop. This furnace won't stop me. This edict won't stop me. God is still on the throne. He still rules over everything. He's still, Jesus still sits at the right hand of God, even if he doesn't. Imagine doing this in front of the most powerful man at this moment in the free world. Having this kind of faith that says, I believe God will. I believe that God can deliver me. I believe that God can restore me. I believe that God can revive me. I believe it, and I'm standing on that today. But even if he doesn't, even if I pray my whole life for cancer to leave, and it doesn't, I won't stop worshiping. This is the kind of faith that I believe we're called into. This kind of faith that believes God for the impossible. This kind of faith that believes God for miracles. And I promise you, God does it all the time. But even when he doesn't. So I'm going to put this on the screen if someone needs to write this down. Here's what double-fisted faith is. I have the faith that you can and will deliver me. That you will restore me. That you will promote me. That you will heal me. I have full confidence and faith that you are going to do it. But even if you don't, my faith will not be shaken. I will still place my trust in you and believe you are good, you have a plan, and your will is perfect. And God, if it is not your will, what I'm praying for, I'll humbly accept that. And believe that as a good and gracious and loving God, you're doing something eternally different than what I can see. All throughout the Bible, we're invited to have faith that can move mountains. Jesus instructed his disciples, if you would have the faith of a mustard seed, you can move this mountain. Was he talking about a physical mountain? No. He was talking about the mountains of unbelief. The mountains of addiction. The mountains of pride, the mountains of self-reliance, the the mountains, the things that just seem to always stand in the way. Jesus invited us to pray bold, ridiculous, faith-filled prayers. So don't ever stop doing that. Don't ever stop giving God all of your faith, all of your belief that he can. Because I believe this brings God so much joy when we have childlike faith. When my son comes up to me and he asks me to do... Anything that pops in his head at the moment. Just thinking that daddy can do this. 
He's bigger, he's stronger than me, I can go ask him. That blesses God when we have that approach, when we have that posture and say, Daddy, would you do this? He loves when we ask. He invites us to do this. But today we need to know that God has purposes and plans that we cannot fully understand. And he doesn't always do things the way that we think he should or will. So when he doesn't answer our prayer, I need you to leave knowing a few things. If your faith truly is in God, I need you to know there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with your prayer. There's nothing wrong with the way that you verbalize it. You didn't leave words out that God was waiting. Oh, if they just would have said this, I would have done this. No. If your faith was filled with God, you can. I've seen you do it, and I'm asking you to do it now. You need to know something. There's nothing broken about you. You need to know that God is always on your side. God is always doing things far beyond what we can understand. So even if he doesn't, it just means that God's will was different. So I'm going to close with this. When Jesus invited his disciples to pray, there's a famous, the Lord's Prayer. And his disciples were earnestly asking, how should we pray? And Jesus says something small but so significant in the midst of his direction to pray. He says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Just this one part of the Lord's prayer. And I want you to know something. I used to think this was a cop-out prayer. I, I, I'm serious. In church history for me, that was, a, that was a weak, unexpected prayer to pray for God's will. No. You pray for that thing and you don't stop until it happens. Even if you got to twist God's arm to do it. And even if, like, you just don't stop. Now, there's a, yes, fervently pray. Don't stop praying and expecting. But, there is a will of God that is so much bigger and so much greater than ours. And so when his disciples came and asked him, how should we pray? Jesus said, pray that my will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. He invited us to pray for his will. And what I used to view as a cop-out, weak prayer, now I boldly pray, God, I want your will over my kids' lives. I want your will over this church. And yeah, I pray for specific things, but God, your will be done. There's nothing like the will of God. There's nothing like the plan and purposes of God. There's nothing like it. And so today, yes, ask specifically. Ask boldly but don't be afraid for a moment to ask and pray that God's will would be done in your life so today I'd like to close with praying that very same prayer over you with the will of God the thought out purposed planned will of God that he's thought about since before you were born would that will of God come to life for you with the pain that you've experienced the prayers that seemed to go unanswered would today would the peace of God cover your heart that it wasn't something wrong with you his will was just different he was eternally doing something that we won't understand until we're not bound to this earth in a sheep's mind I'd love to pray for you if you bow your heads close your eyes for a moment Today, Father, we just come into a posture of you are good, your will is good, your plan is good. Since the moment of creation, you've been good. But God, sometimes if we're being honest in our life, we, we're confused about how do we have faith when you don't do what we're asking you to do. God, today I pray that you would minister to our heart in a way that only you can. Your Holy Spirit can heal what no one else can hear. Your Holy Spirit can inform us and reveal to us things that we could never otherwise know. And so today, God, in our hearts with these big, bold questions, God, where are you? Why haven't you done this? When are you going to do it? 
God, I pray today we would have great assurance in your perfect will. God, I pray that we would pray bold prayers. I pray that we would leave here asking you for healing, asking you for miracles, asking you for resurrected lives. God, asking you for the impossible. I pray that we would live our whole life childlike, asking you for big and bold and crazy things. But God, I pray that when things don't work out exactly how we prayed, I pray that this wouldn't shake our faith. I pray that it would cause us to lean in even further, to rely on you even more, to depend on your perfect power being activated in the midst of my greatest weakness. God, I pray for the person in here that says, I feel weak, I feel beaten down, because you would say, good. Because now I can give you what only comes through perfect weakness. It's my peace and my goodness and my power. Today, God, will we open our hearts to receive that. God, today I thank you that your plan for us was your son would come and redeem us and resurrect us bring life to us and so if there's someone here today that says I've listened to all this and the greatest hindrance I've ever had is I've never truly confessed Jesus as Lord I've never confessed my need for a savior I've never turned over control if that's you today and you say I don't know Jesus as my savior before you leave here we're actually gonna have a one of our elders and a pastor up here we would love to pray with you We'd love to talk to you, but if someone else in here, if you want someone to pray with you today, we'll have people available. That as we stand and close in worship, would we give God praise, whether he's done it exactly how we prayed or he's doing it different. Would we praise him all the same? Would you stand to your feet as we close? I am chosen, not forsaken. I am house in my father's 